Hi, I'm Jerry Beck, and this is our CIFA uh, Q&A with uh, the Chiodo brothers, Stephen and Edward, their fantastic Netflix special or film, I guess, uh, Alien Xmas. I think that's how I should pronounce it, right? Or Alien Christmas. Either way, I think people will kind of get the joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. Very interchangeable. Uh, yeah. And uh, they are there on the other screen with the cast from the film, which I'm so impressed with. I can't believe it. Are those actual models, puppets of the that you used under the camera? Yes. Yes, they are. Yeah, we had, this is X, our main character. It's like a little animation puppet that was made by a, a, a crew of maybe 20, 30 people. Uh, oh, please tell us about, uh, about some of the other characters there. Oh yeah, and then we have uh, Holly. He's our little seven-year-old elf who uh, misses her father during the holidays. And, uh, and then we have uh, Sam Two. Sam Two is the X's cohort in his invasion. And Sam Two stands for Semi-Automatic Multitasking Unit. He's sort of like a, a Swiss army robot with thousands of attachments to help him complete his task. This is uh, Noelle, Holly's mom, Obi's wife, mm -hmm. Marion in uh, the North Pole. And then we have, of course, we have Santa with his top elf, Obi. Yes. And uh, Obi is Holly's father. And he's been so busy trying to build Santa Super Sleigh this year that he hasn't had time to spend with Holly and the family, which is, that's Obi's dilemma in our story. We have, we have uh, Z, the evil supreme leader of the Kleps. Now the Kleps are an evil race of aliens that come from a planet with no color. And uh, they go around the universe stealing from all these civilizations. They're a, a race that wants, 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 but doesn't know how to give. I'm gonna uh, start by mentioning my, uh, just geeking out a little bit <clears throat> about the, the, the characters uh, and the production of the film. Um, because as you guys probably know, I'm a major animation nut and, uh, you heard, <laughs> you heard of that, that. And I, and I, and I looked at it and I'm like, this is, you guys are known for edgy stuff. You guys are known for a, a different kind of thing. And this is a, a classic Christmas special, but yet retaining your edge. That's the way <laughs> I see it. And, um, so I noticed a few things like, um, there's sort of that Rankin Bass feel. I even a little bit of Art Cloakey in there, you know, uh, kind of a feel. But then it gets invaded by, you know, I'm going to call it Chiodo Edge because I don't know what else to compare it to. Uh, but it's invaded, you know, the, the special effects and alien stuff is like nothing I've seen, you know, in any special like this. And um, uh, it's really cool. And one more thing about that character on the end, the, the, the head clept. Uh, the uh, uh, he sort of reminded me of um, a little bit of, uh, and then he, this may not be your influence, but it reminded me of that the characters in uh, First Men in the Moon. Remember the the aliens oh, in that? Yes, yes. You know, well, all the things you mentioned, all the influence we we had our entire lives, the holiday specials, the sci-fi, the monster movies, is all kind of thrown into that Kyoto mix. Yeah, you've really you've really hit it on the head. It is that that mashup, the classic Rankin and Bass holiday special with all its love and sweetness and caring invaded, literally invaded by a science fiction. And we were inspired by Rankin and Bass to actually do this. We'd always wanted to make a, a holiday special like this. Uh, and the influences are, I mean, it's a, a classic Scrooge tale, the story of redemption. Uh, but then we wanted to do something different that stood out. Uh, so we yeah. created a holiday special, the likes of which maybe nobody's ever seen before. I think so. Um, so uh, remind me or let me know what the story is here. I see it was based on a book that you wrote or illustrated and or illustrated that was at least... 10 or 15 years ago or something. Can you just give me that chronology? Where did this concept come from? It was based on a book that you did? Is that- well, Yeah, even before that, actually, we were doing contract work for ABC Family at the time, doing um, bumpers, animated stop motion bumpers for their 25 days of Christmas um, thing. And it, that was, it was a lot of fun for us because again, we always wanted to do animated holiday specials. And the executive we were working with kind of asked if we had any holiday special ideas. And Stephen had this idea that was percolating in his head uh, that uh, we actually developed into a pitch. It actually was a, 
a traditional media pitch originally. Hmm. And um, we took it out and people loved it, but you know, stop motion time, you know, time consuming expensive. So it just didn't happen back then. And it was an original property, which is a difficult thing to sell in today's market. Right. But, uh, but going through the development process for the pitch, we had all these incredible assets. We had the, the, the characters, the stories, presentation, artwork, and maquettes. So it became the makings of, of a book. And we had an opportunity with uh, Bob Self and Baby Tattoo Books who heard the story, saw the presentation, and just kind of fell in love with it and gave us a, a book deal. Yeah, so it was, uh, I, I co-wrote it with Jim Strain. He was a, a screenplay writer on the, on the Jumanji film. Hmm. And then, uh, so we wrote it and my brother Charlie did the illustrations and Bob Self and Baby Tattoo published it. Did that make it easier once you had a physical book of it uh, to sell? I know you had a pitch, but did having it as a, a book make it some kind of an easier thing for Netflix? You know, it, to pick it, up? Became, it became very tangible. It was a, a commodity at that point that people, you know, a book, and it wasn't a self-published thing. It was a legitimate publisher you know, in sales on, you know, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon and everything. So yeah, people did re react to it differently. And we got, we got a bunch of, a bunch of meetings on it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the film business, it's tough to get things launched, but yeah, people did take it a little more seriously. But, and, what, but what it was our connection with uh, John Favreau that really put it over the top. Yeah. We had worked with John on Elf. Again, he loves stop motion, specifically Rankin and Bass, <laughs> which is what we, he contracted us to do on Elf. So we kind of struck up a relationship there and we pitched it to John and he really took to it. He liked the story at the core of the heart of the story was uh, the spirit of Christmas, the act of love when you give a, a gift to somebody. And uh, he took to that and he, we, we took it out with him. That's fantastic. My two favorite things of, the, uh, of this particular month are your special and the Mandalorian. Both of them have the Fairview entertainment logo on it. So uh, yeah, yeah. kudos. Um, the production of this, um, did you do this here in L in LA, this film? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Uh, we did all the, uh, the pre-production design work and fabrication here at our studios, uh, Kyoto Brothers in San Fernando. And then when we got ready to shoot, we moved over to Big Picks Entertainment and rented their uh, shooting facility to do the actual production there because it was, it was much larger than our facility could accommodate. Um, well, I'm going to ask all these, you know, basic questions about the production, like, uh, like how long, once you had it go going, and I assume you had the storyboards, you probably pre-recorded the track, right? And then you, then you, uh, then how long was the actual production? I'm also assuming you did multiple stages, you know, uh, while you were doing it. Uh, how long did it take to do? Yeah, we, um, we started, actually, it was a very accelerated process because there was um, initially a desire to air this in 2019. So we started writing the script in uh, late, you know, fall of 2018, went into pre-production in April of uh, 2019, started shooting in June, and we finished shooting at the end of, uh, in the interim, they, Netflix decided that we should just slow down and push it till this year, but mm. we, we kept on going. We actually finished shooting just before the Christmas holiday last year in uh, 2019, mm. and we did all our post work um, this early this year through COVID. And uh, we delivered in August. Wow. So wow. it's pretty, pretty accelerated. It's a 40 minute uh, film, but we had 16 stages, anywhere from eight to 12 animators working at any given time. That's pretty fantastic. And you guys, I, I guess the word is lucked out that you finished it before the pandemic and, and then we're able to do it. I would like to hear just a little bit about uh, working, you know, in the last six months and what that was like with uh, people over. I mean, maybe it's normal now or not. I don't know, but. Um... Yeah, it, it is. I mean, uh, uh, we again, we were fortunate. We had just wrapped principal photography. So it was all post-production after effects work. And a lot of that was done uh, over the internet. But when we got to color grading and the mix, these are things that we really needed to be in the room and the companies we worked with accommodated our needs and it was isolation and uh, we got in and out and uh, were able to complete it. Yeah, we were running a, we were running a, a traditional post, you know, effects room, you know, VFX artists in a room working together that we, we shut down when the town shut down. So we went to, we operated remotely and that worked pretty good for, you know, VFX, they would do their work, they would send it to Steven, we'd have a VFX review session, you know, um, so that worked out well. 
But then when it came crunch time, I had to bring those artists back together because we needed the output more immediate and one-on-one -on -one interaction. So we had, we set up a whole COVID safety team where we had a, uh, an EMT, an officer, you know, regular COVID testings, you know, the cleaning, check-ins, temperature check, the whole deal. Wow, that's actually very interesting because <clears throat> we're talking to a lot of animation studios and basically nobody's going anywhere near anybody. Everybody's doing everything over Zoom or whatever, you know, and um, yeah. I'm actually fascinated that you actually got together with people or went to the post-production places. That's pretty yeah. cool. And, and Netflix was uh, very supportive. Uh, they, they stepped up, you know, whatever it took to ensure the safety of the crew, the personnel, they were there right with us. Uh, and then funny, not not this project, but we had another stop motion project, an indie feature that happened right, all that guy actually got shut down because of the pandemic. And then we resumed in April and August on that one in factual physical production. And mm -hmm. it was very much the same thing. The company on that one, incredibly supportive, on-site weekly testing, safety officers, smaller crews for longer days sort of thing. Split shifts. Uh, which, uh, which, was really, which was really an interesting pr uh, production process. But that, that's a great project. That'll be our next Q&A when that, that movie is ready to be announced. <laughs> definitely. I definitely want to know more about it because I'm fascinated. I mean, I'm, 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 I don't know of any other situation. I mean, I'm not following stop motion that closely, I guess, but I don't know any other situation where uh, most people are working at home. That's what I know. You know, yeah. most people are working at home. So I don't know much where they're working at a studio and, and making it happen, which is fascinating to me. I want to ask about uh, some of the other aspects of the production. These are the what I call the obvious questions in my mind. Uh, one is um, you had a lot of what I call optical effects. At least we used to call them that, uh, you know, the, <laughs> ray, the ray beams and things like that. Who did that? How, how was that done? That's obviously animated, right? Well, we did, we did embrace a, the digital technology and, and post compositing, but all of the elements we used were done uh, traditionally through stop motion. The rays were maybe salt or sugar on glass, and we used those as elements. Uh, the fire in the fireplace was uh, a cartoon animation that we then translated into little replacement um, uh, plastic pieces that were shot and then composited. So it all has a handmade quality. Yeah, Cam Cameron Carson was our VFX supervisor, and he he led a small army of uh, VFX artists. And yeah, it was uh, we really tried to you know outside of the digital technology for rig removal, we really tried to embrace you know how Rankin and Bass would would have done it. Yeah, yeah. So that that that's a, you mentioned the the word replacement uh, animation. Um, is that um, used a lot? I mean, I guess Sam too. Uh, is that used a lot here or not? I mean, explain well, that to me. It actually, actually was. Well, Sam too has all these uh, appendages, these mechanical arms that come out and all those were replacement. Hmm. But then specifically for X, his eyes were all replacement elements, very much like George Powell did in the puppetoons back in the 40s. Right. Uh, since X doesn't speak, his performance is a, a lot of pantomime, but I think the expression of the eyes changing helped uh, convey his inner emotions, that along with Dee Bradley Baker's incredible voice talent. Uh, so he, uh, the eyes were physical replacement animation, while the mouths were a 2D post-production uh, composite. Huh, oh, wow, okay, interesting, really cool, uh, using all the techniques to get back to that funky look, you know, that was, you know, done in Japan or whatever in, back in 1962 well, or something. That, that's exactly, I yeah. mean, we could make it incredibly refined and, uh, you know, make people question it is it is this computer generated or not but that for us that's not the the, the fun we don't want to lose the hand of the maker oh, yeah, yeah. The, the gyrotron effect i mean that's really light painting or time last photography uh it's not it's not any kind of digital enhancement it's just that we shot those elements and composited them on top yeah right. there's only one one little sequence that we we opted for the dark side where we actually use computer generated images oh really which sequence which sequence is that Oh, I, it's the, the the spaceships at the end. Oh yeah, without revealing what it is when they turn. I mean, we had we had miniatures. We were ready to shoot them, but uh, time and schedule. It was easier for us to just make them CG. You know what's cool? What's cool to me is you know you look at something like that, especially at the beginning where it's really rank and bassy, and and you, you know you, somebody like me goes, yeah, I could probably do that. You know, I could probably make those things. <laughs> but then as the show goes on, it gets more and more elaborate. You know, and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street, it just gets completely, you know, crazy by the end with the effects and everything. 
So it's like, by the end, I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, that's amazing. Yeah, so. Well, it was the, the team of animators we had was so, it, it was so talented. Yeah. We had Blanchett who handled a lot of the Sam 2 animation. And we had Tucker Barry and Ijo Lee. They did a lot of the sensitive, very fine performances of Holly and X. And then Justin Rach did some kick-ass action animation and Kent Burton was doing stuff. Uh, I worked with uh, Cameron Beatty, who was the animation director. And uh, we kind of, we squeaked these great performances out of it. And Savannah Steiner did an incredible job with Santa Claus. He's one of my favorite characters too. Not your typical Santa Claus. No, no, uh, no, a great character though. I will say, I like, we love Santa Claus in this movie. He's so forgiving and has a good answer for everything. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, um, I want to, uh, since you're mentioning everybody, uh, I have to admit that, uh, they won't remember me at all, but about 20 or 30 years ago, I was in the uh, Japanese anime dubbing world and I noticed some of my friends' names there, Barbara Goodson, Kirk Thornton, Tony Oliver, are people I worked with decades ago in dubbing yeah. uh, anime. So uh, I'm glad to see them uh, you know, getting such great parts in this, in this special and uh, uh, they're under acknowledged in my opinion. Yeah, Tony really? not only gave, did voices for us, he was our voice director. Yeah, he was ah. great. Tony was a great yeah. guy to work with, did a fantastic job, and he, yeah. he gave us some of the great voices too. And, and Barbara Goodson, not, it's funny, she has the, oh, an extreme, not only did she voice Z, she also did little, little, little kid elves. Uh -huh. <laughs> talk talk so, about range and versatility. Yeah, and the newcomer, yeah. uh, uh, Kayla Rambo, who did our Holly, she was great. We wanted to make sure we had a young voice. We didn't want an adult doing it. Right. And she pulled off a great performance. Right, right. Uh, and Keith was a fantastic Santa Claus. Uh, we, we're so happy with our performances. Well, um, uh, Stephen, you're, our, you're a colleague of mine at Cal Arts, I, uh, yeah. I, I read, because I teach history there. And uh, uh, the um, stop motion, and this is something I say to my students practically every week. I mean, stop motion seems to be more popular these days with students, with the public, with uh, the amount of production more than ever. When I do a, a history of stop motion in my class, it's about the, almost you can count them on two hands, famous figures since Willis O'Brien or, or even uh, Jay Stewart Blackton that, you know, up, it's, it's, it's really only X number of people of which you, you guys are part of. Uh, but, uh, but there's more of it happening right now than ever, as far as I'm, as far as I know, you know. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, absolutely. Do you think is the popularity? Um, uh, why do you think it still resonates with uh, young people? Uh, I, I think it's because it's a it's a handmade technique. I think CG is a wonderful tool, uh, but I don't think it satisfies that inherent need that artists have to get their hands dirty to physically touch things. Yeah. I mean, as real as CG is, it's always fake and stop motion. As fake as it might look, it's tangible, it's real. And I think audiences see that magic of them coming alive. Right. But when Tim Burton did his Nightmare Before Christmas, that was a benchmark that I think really thrust us into this new renaissance. And I think it was in part Tim's story and his art direction, but it also was the technology. Going into frame grabbers where you can actually see like an onion skinning of your performance while you're animating, gave the animators a new fluidity, a reference as to what they were producing. And I think Jamie Caleri's um, Dragon Frame, software that you use in conjunction with your digital photography and your computers actually brings that sensibility and, and, and helps production like, like no other. You don't have to wait for dailies the next day. Right. You can actually see your shot, address it, and then move on right then or immediately. Yeah, the digital technology has just opened up some, a, a world for not only rig removal, you're not, you're not have, you don't have to tie your puppets down and make sure you hide rigs because you know, it would be an expensive, expensive optical if you did it in film. Now in the digital world, to remove support rigs um, is so much easier. So the, in some ways, the puppets don't need to be as good as they once were. We don't need the sophisticated steel ball and socket and armature and socket. We can get away with wire knowing that we could support them in other ways or and just even have the precision for the animator to match up the action frame to frame. So it's just um, the technology has just opened up this new core creativity amongst the artists. It, it gives the artists a, a greater flexibility. It gives them time to spend on the puppet, not the technical aspect of it. And, uh, but with all the technology, it still is the animator with the puppet moving at one frame at a time. That after all these, after a hundred years, that hasn't changed. Right, that's great. I love that. Um, do you, is, the, is the constructing of the puppet is that changed or is that is that the the same as it's always been? 
it's uh, I, I guess at the core it's about the same yeah I mean, some have ball and socket armatures the, <clears throat> most of the characters are uh, wire armatures our head of puppets was Becky Van Cleve and uh, I, I we used wire for most of them yeah but you know in terms of you know sculpture is involved we did a lot of you know traditional clay sculptures but when it came down to like refining the characters or doing variations we found out doing them digitally in zbrush was a much more useful tool uh, we could save the variations go back change things on the fly without losing previous iterations so you know we use a lot of digital sculpting and uh, 3d printing yeah, you could change that's, the scale so easily. I that's just, what I was going to ask about 3D printing. I mean, I don't. I that's so new. I'm not even up on it. But that's that's the way you can create the uh, uh, the, the replacement pieces, right? Yeah, yeah. The eyes on the character, you know, they're just 3D printed replacement eyes. And does somebody? I love that. See? Yeah. Pop on and off. Do the, a little magnets in each of them. So just so I understand, does somebody sit at an animation table and animate, let's say, the eyes up, opening up and down, and then and then somehow you 3D print that? Is that how that works, or do I not understand? No, actually, we drew them 2D yeah. first, got a cycle, or at least the extremes we wanted, right. and then we sculpted them. I think Nikki Rice sculpted them in ZBrush, and then we outputted them as 3D models here at the studio. I see. Wow. And then her team created the actual you know, the, the, physical, the physical props with the magnets so they actually registered inside the heads. Amazing. And then enabled us to make so many of them. We had like maybe 20 or 30 Xs. And uh -huh. uh, so it's a urethane head and uh, it's got silicone for the body. We sculpted the character in ZBrush, made a mold and then cast them out of silicone. Amazing, just fantastic. Um, I'm looking at my notes and I wrote down my... I literally wrote down when I stopped laughing my favorite my favorite uh, bit in the film, which was Santa pulling out those nunchucks. From the, <laughs> you know, and I was like, <laughs> that totally threw me. I thought, I mean, the, the film has everything that you want. It has heart. It has humor. It has action and uh, special effects and visuals. Um, you know, uh, I, I mean, all I, I mean, I, I I don't know if I'm done yet here, but I just feel like saying thank you. It's really really refreshing is another word I'd use. Uh, oh, thank you. Well, thanks. Coming from you, that's, that's a real compliment. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, no, and, and, and part of it, you know, is uh, I think that's what John was drawn to as well. You know, he saw that the, the heart and actually in our process and working with him was he maintained, he made, kept us on, on task in terms of what the core story is, you know, what the heart is that, you know, we, we tend to try and make things a little bigger and go a little wilder. And he kept on bringing us back to, no, this is a a, a simple story. Let's keep it. Let's don't lose that that core, yeah. that thread. Well, that you just answered my 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 question that I had in my head, which was what was John's involvement uh, beyond being uh, you know a producer, a presenter. Um, uh, but that sounds like uh, that sounds like mostly it. Um, no, I tell you, uh, Jerry, he was a great collaborator. I mean, yeah. he a billion dollar director could be kind of intimidating, but when it comes down to talking story, talking character, he's right there with us creatively. And his insight, I, I learned an awful lot working with him, uh, just how to really cut through all of the, 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 the bullshit and just get to the character. What is the emotion that we're getting from the character? What is the emotion we're getting from the scene? And uh, working towards getting that out to the audience so that they're left with something more than just a joke. They're actually left with something they can think and feel after the show's over. You guys are very articulate about this and I love it. You're, you're doing great at what, uh... I, do you have something coming up, uh, working on another project? I'm sure it's top secret, but uh, what can well, we, you tell yeah, us we, about the, what's next? We just we just finished the top secret project, another stop motion thing based on a very popular internet character. Ooh. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Ooh. Okay. So yeah, that, right. that, that'll be out uh, early next year. We'll be able to make an announcement. Hopefully we get to, uh, to talk about that. Yeah. And if everybody watches it, I don't, there's no, there's no box office. There's no Nielsen ratings. I don't know how to tell if it's a success or not, but yeah. write to Netflix and let them know you loved Alien Christmas and maybe there'll be a Alien Halloween. Yeah. Mul multiple, <laughs> multiple, multiple viewings on, uh, on Netflix and like the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that will happen. I'm sure. Uh, make sure you, uh, submit this to the Annie's uh, we, we were happy to say or ask oh um, that would be and, wonderful and uh, that's really I'm going to wrap it up I think this is fantastic it's a wonderful film 
Alien Christmas, check it out. Alien Xmas, I think that's the way I like, I'd rather pronounce it. <laughs> and uh, keep up the great work. And it's so great. I, I, I just, I'm, the animation world is uh, fantastic because we don't really have to stop, you know? Oh, and yeah, yeah. Like, and we're, we're lucky. We're lucky people. Yeah. And uh, uh, keep doing what you're doing. And, and I'll take... Uh, I'll take the character on the left and the one in the center. And yeah, okay. And uh, and I'll leave it at that and uh, have a merry uh, Earth Christmas <laughs> from all of us. Thank well, you, Jodos. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank right. you. Well, all right. Bye-bye.